Anytime a TV show goes into production, there are always ideas that get left on the cutting room floor. Whether it be due to network interference or the production team just not figuring out how to flesh out the idea in a way that works with the series tone, this can lead to a lot of stories that leave fans wondering what could have been. Luckily for us, while most of these stories never see the light of day, the crew behind Batman the Animated Series just can't seem to quit teasing us with behind the scenes info. I'm Maddie with the Watchtower Database, and in this multi-part series, we'll be talking about every Batman the Animated Series episode that you've never seen. And we get a big old title card! Following the success of Tim Burton's 1989 Batman film, Warner Brothers decided they wanted to get out a second film in the series as soon as possible. And once production on Batman Returns was greenlit, they turned to the company's animation division to start working on a Batman animated series. The problem? While being veterans of animation from Looney Tunes through Tiny Tunes, Warner Bros. Animation had never produced an action-oriented cartoon. And before anybody points it out in the comments, previous DC cartoons such as The Super Friends were actually produced by Hanna-Barbera, who didn't become a subsidiary of Warner until later on in 1996. Luckily, Bruce Timm, who had previous experience on shows like He-Man, She-Ra, and G.I. Joe, stepped up to the plate and, along with Eric Radomski, created the pitch reel and series bible that got production moving on Batman. Often lauded as proof that the creators of Batman the Animated Series knew what they were doing from the start, the writer's bible for the show is an absolute treasure trove of information about the earliest days of the cartoon's production. Being that the bible was written long before any episodes ever aired, a lot of ideas we see in it were reworked or cut altogether by the time Batman went to air. Among these are a handful of episode synopses, and while some of them did make it to air in one way or another, such as slightly varied origins for Man Bat, Ventriloquist, Ra's al Ghul, and Two-Face, as well as variations on the episodes via Clown, Christmas with the Joker, POV, and Zatanna, there were still 13 potential episodes that never quite made it, including a Killer Croc origin episode. An animal trader is bitten by a rare species of lizard while delivering it to Gotham Zoological Gardens and contracts a strange disease that hardens his skin into a bulletproof hide. His mind is warped with an equal toughness and Killer Croc is born, terrorizing the city with the release of reptiles into the sewers and a plot to steal the rare lizard to create an army of invincible followers. But when his theft goes awry, Batman follows him into the reptile-filled sewers and uses his detective skills to track him down. A premise that sounds as though it may have gone on to at least inspire the episode Tiger Tiger. A wealthy but cruel acquaintance of Bruce Wayne's has set up a private island where rich sportsmen pay top dollar to hunt rare big cats. When the Catwoman gets wind of it, she journeys to the island and soon finds herself hunted. Luckily, Batman arrives on the same trail and both find themselves the prizes of the winner's most dangerous game. This one that sounds a lot like what's going on in James Tinian's current run on the Batman. Locked in the inescapable hard timers wing of Stonegate Prison, a criminal mastermind known as the Architect is sprung when the impervious walls of Stonegate are miraculously exploded. The Architect dives into the icy waters of Gotham Harbor and never surfaces. Soon, high security buildings everywhere are breached and the Batman attempts to thwart the Architect in an adventure that leads him to the Architect's secret submarine base and a battle below the waters of Gotham Harbor. The similarities are kind of odd since the Architect wasn't really a thing in comics until 2011. I wonder if they got inspiration for him from this. Or maybe they were both inspired by the other villain, the Quake Master? This one was based off the old characterization of the Mad Hatter, where he just does silly hat crimes. It's Cap Day at Gotham Stadium, where Bruce Wayne and the Gotham populace don baseball caps chemically treated by the Mad Hatter and his Alice in Wonderland gang. As paranoia sweeps the city, the episode becomes a twisted Batman in Wonderland, as the Mad Hatter's robbery scheme uses the ensuing chaos and a disoriented Batman fights for sanity while trying to thwart the crimes. Also a much less compelling origin for Mr. Freeze. After a freak accident in his cryogenics lab, Mr. Freeze is created and uses the lab as a front for the theft of the valuable ice called Diamond. As museums and jewelry stores suddenly 
Harley freeze, and diamonds are stolen, Batman's detective skills lead him north to Freeze's Arctic smuggling operation and a battle in the snow with the deadly cold foe. This one right here sounds a lot like the plot of Gotham Adventures number 29. While investigating a series of crimes attributed to the mysterious Poison Ivy, Batman is poisoned, and he and Robin have only 24 hours to track down Poison Ivy and the antidote. As the Batman weakens in the final hours, the salvation of the Dark Knight is entirely in Robin's hands, and the clock is ticking. There's another that sounds awfully similar to beats from Batman Begins. The Scarecrow infects Gotham's water supply and jams TV and radio transmissions with images and sounds of the Batman, triggering an epidemic of bat terror in the populace. When Batman is spotted that night, he finds himself pursued by rabid mobs of police and citizens as he attempts to track down the Scarecrow and his antidote. At least the water supply bit from that made its way into dreams and darkness. And there are six more that I'm just gonna read off to you without further comment, because that's what the whole Australia box down under is for. Be the comments you wish to see in a Watchtower database video. Exhausting his final lead in a current case, Batman sneaks into Stonegate Prison in order to question a connected prisoner who refuses to talk. Once there, he realizes that a trap has been set by prison kingpin Mr. Big, who comfortably runs his criminal network from within his cell. As word spreads of the Batman's presence, a riot ensues. Pursued by sworn enemies furious for revenge, Batman fights his way through the bowels of the prison, only to be captured and marched down death row and strapped into the electric chair. Luckily, the Riddler springs him at the last minute, not about to have the honor of beating Batman robbed from him by a bunch of low-life jailbirds. The Riddler has infiltrated the lethal security system of a newly constructed skyscraper, and after robbing the building's vault, sits with his loot on the top floor and challenges Batman to come get him. When Batman arrives, he discovers that the Riddler has reprogrammed the security system to destroy the Dark Knight, and a dizzying array of narrow escapes ensues as he makes his way to the penthouse rendezvous with the Riddler. When two panels of a famous triptych are stolen, and the third destroyed, a series of similar crimes follow, all based on stealing trios of items. In each case, one is destroyed, and the remaining two are seized by Two-Face. Setting his sights on the trio of Batman, Robin, and Batgirl, he captures Batgirl and lures the dynamic duo to his estate, planning to stalk them all and destroy one of the three. But which one? Bruce Wayne is personally supervising the deposit of Wayne industry files in an underground storage facility when Clayface's well-armed group of thieves descend into the high security operation. Unable to change into the Batman, Wayne uses the cover of darkness and a flurry of bats from a connecting cavern to convince the villains that Batman is among them. He then must escape unnoticed and return as Batman, hoping to stop the robbery before it's completed. Ocean vessels are falling prey to robberies by Blackbeard and his band of modern day pirates. But when an entire ocean liner disappears, Bruce Wayne discreetly charters a cruise, following the missing liner's course, and finds himself in the Sargasso Seas, legendary graveyard of lost ships. Discovering that Blackbeard and his band converted the liner into a hidden half-submerged base intending to increase their piracy, it's up to Batman to stop them. When the lights come up at Gotham's Opera Hall, the wealthy audience finds all of their valuables stolen. Among the audience is Bruce Wayne, and soon, Batman is pitted against the Mad Maestro, whose compositions have recently been rejected by the Gotham Musical Academy. Vowing revenge on the judging committee, the Madman begins a musical reign of terror from his hidden lair in the Gotham Opera House. <sighs> While none of these episodes ever ended up on air, it's still very possible that at least some of them were actually scripted at one point or another. The script were rejected, expect the unexpected. We'll be right back. Well, hey there, it's me, Rocco, from the 90s hit TV show, Rocco's Modern Life. Obviously, modern life right now consists mostly of staying in bed half of the day and crying because you're uncertain of everything that's going on around you. But did you know you could also party in your bed? Like a Patreon part? That's the back of the list. That's the front of the list, but it's upside down. 
There we go. Tyler J. Harrowa has upped their patronage. That's really cool of you. Thanks for supporting us even more than you already did, Tyler. You're a trooper. And then we got the people that we always shout out because they give us more money than even makes sense. Dark Poet, 1792. Aaron Young. Cameo Shadowness. Daniel Chan. David Gallagher. Luke Mears. Mac. Robert Sterling. And Richard Mon 12. Thanks for all that you do. You make the crying in bed just a little less. I really hope modern life Life changes soon. It's hot inside of that thing. Now, back to our program. And here we have the next title card! Batman the Animated Series? More like Bad Scripts Man the Animated Series. <laughs> Am I right? You see, in all reality, while Tim and Radomski knew a lot about Batman, the fact of the matter is they didn't really know what they were doing from the start in terms of running a TV show. Since neither of the two had ever been showrunners before, the studio enlisted the Smurf story editor, Sean Catherine Derrick, to help out. Unfortunately, according to series writer Martin Pasco, when Sean had been asked whether or not she knew Batman in her interview, her response was less confident, and following the interview, she went home to do a crash course on the character. Uh, the campy 1966 version. This led to a lot of weird decisions that didn't quite fit the tone the show was going for. According to Eric Radomski, at one point Ace the Bat Hound was in play, saying They were even talking about giving Batman a dog so he would have a dog in the Bat Cave. <laughs> and it was like no, <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? But they thought it would be a macho kind of cool thing, but it would still soften them. And then we were like, no fucking way. We're not giving them a dog. <laughs> And according to Kevin Altieri, scripts included emphasis on things like there being a recycling bin in the Batcave. I bet it wouldn't surprise you to learn that once she left Batman, Sean moved on to Captain Planet. As I'm sure you can tell, in the first few months of pre-production, Tim and Radomski had serious creative differences with Sean. According to the Batman animated book, they felt that scripts weren't quite reaching the level of sophistication that they were aiming for, and she felt that their directors and storyboard artists were taking too many liberties with the scripts. Though not all the bad scripts were solely her fault, as Bruce Tim explained years later in back issue number 99. Early on, before we had even hired Sean, we had developed a bunch of scripts with a bunch of different freelance writers that just didn't happen. And that's typical of any show. You get a lot of things in development, and hopefully you realize early enough on that it's not working, and you don't have to spend too many wasted man hours on it. But whether or not the blame solely laid on her shoulders, a point came where there were enough straws on the camel's back. I actually threw one out of my office. It was so bad. I remember that it was the ventriloquist dummy. It wasn't Scarface, though. We had to get a show into production. Bruce said, I know this one's not that good, you know, but just give it a read. Let's hammer it out. We'll make it work. And I had board artists reading it, and they went, oh, man, you know, this, this one, no, 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 no. And I'm like, oh, come on, you know. And so after trying to cajole everyone into it, I read it and I get to the climax where Batman is wrestling with a ventriloquist dummy. It's in a prison and there's this ventriloquist dummy that attacks him and he actually has like a wrestling match with it. And I just, at that point, I just went, no! And I threw the thing, <laughs> I just picked it up spontaneously, threw it. <laughs> It left the door of my office and the brads came undone. And it, so it just flew like confetti. And I was like, okay, I'm fired. But they, no, they didn't. Gene McCurdy actually read the script and says, yeah, yeah, this is a problem. But that's when they brought in Randy Rogel and Alan Burnett. The discontent with these scripts wasn't limited to the production team. Following a phone conversation between Fox Kids VP Sidney I. Warner and Warner Bros. Animation President Gene McCurdy, Sean Catherine Derrick was out and Alan Burnett was in. Sidney called up and he said, these scripts aren't really delivering. We, you know, we need to talk. And it was at that point that they brought in Alan Burnett, who put together as, as producer and the head of the writing. He was the executive producer, and he brought in the story editors, Marty Pasco and Michael Reeves and Paul Dini. And it's those four people who really brought the narrative drive to the series. And now that Alan was on board, the series limbo box of scripts that were already paid for but wouldn't make it to air went 
out the window. A move that on separate occasions, Marty Pasco has said cost as low as 30 to $50,000, upwards to almost six figures. With scripts costing about $6,000 a piece, this could have been anywhere between five to 16 stories thrown out. Among those scripts were Robin scripts, Batmite scripts, and one script that had been rejected by both Fox and DC titled Rockabye Batman, where Batman becomes a babysitter. What's going on there? Is that a baby? Is there something you need to tell me? We'll be right back. And now, Batman. Title card! Now, I'm trying to do all of these in chronological order of when they were written, but this one seems to vary depending on who you ask. According to Randy Rogel, this script was written before Alan came on board, but according to Tom Ruger, it wasn't that early at all and was more likely midway through the first season, sometime after he had written Beware the Grey Ghost. Whichever is the case, this is one that Alan Burnett has loved to bring up over the years, so why not discuss it right after his joining the show? We've discussed this before on our video about whether or not the Joker was responsible for the Wayne homicides in the DCAU, but for those of you who missed that, the one and only gun story, or the gun story, or the story about a gun, depending on who you ask about it, was a script written by Tom Ruger and another writer. Randy Rogel has suggested it may have been Gary Wolf about the gun that killed Thomas and Martha Wayne. The episode would have opened up in a rock quarry where ore was being mined by a large corporation, but but while mining, they would be confronted by a Native American who informs the workers that this was a sacred burial ground and they weren't welcome. Uninterested in their demands to leave, a representative of the company blows them off saying, okay, sue us, we'll see you in court, and carries on. The ore, implied to be cursed due to its origin, goes through the furnace, turns into rivulets, and goes through the entire manufacturing process to become a pistol. Finally, in the gun shop, a customer looking up at the pistol on the rack tells the shop owner he's interested in it and pays for the pistol, then kills the guy that sold it to him. As we go on, we come to find out that the purchaser was none other than Jack Napier. As we follow the gun home, it's put into a safe, the safe is closed, then blackness. Years pass and suddenly a white window opens up, revealing a hand coming at you as the gun has been stowed away in a car glove compartment. This all leads up to the Wayne murders, but it doesn't stop there. We watch this gun get flipped into the river and fish out by a kid, and as we follow the gun, we come to find out that it played into different plot lines from throughout the series until finally Batman recovers it, melts it down again, and uses the metal to make an inscription on his parents' monument. According to Paul Dini, the script was a potential award winner, but at the end of the day, it was too intense for the censors, and there was no way to soft pedal the story without killing the impact. Even though the episode was never produced, the script still exists out there somewhere. According to Randy Rogel, he was so impressed by the script that he took it and years later when the show was coming to DVD, Warner Bros. Animation called to do an interview with him and he brought it up. Excitedly, the interviewer asked him to bring it in and copies were made, supposedly to use as a bonus feature on the DVD, but it never actually made it to the disc. So hey, Warner Bros, or Randy, if you're listening, could you put that out somewhere? My arm is getting so tired holding this. Making our way through the rest of season one, there were even more episodes that never made it on screen. Penguin Pictures Presents was a script that Henry Gilroy, the writer of Nothing to Fear, did some rewrite work on before it was ultimately canned. According to Gilroy, in the script, the Penguin owned a movie studio in Gotham City that he was using as a front for money laundering, a la the producers. Apparently, he still has the episode outline, so Henry, if you're out there, We'd love to see that one too. Another such story comes from Marty Pasco, though with even less detail. He had pitched a Mad Hatter story to Alan Burnett that was generally well received. Not to be confused with the proposed episode from the Writer's Bible, this one was also based on the Mad Hatter from the comics, who at the time was more focused on hat-themed crimes rather than mind manipulation. Alan left a multitude of editorial notes on the script that Marty fixed up and brought back to Alan. But after the second pass was approved, Alan had to break the 
the news that Bruce Tim wanted to go in a different direction with the character, and that script was dead in the water. Before they finally perfected the concept with the Riddler episode What is Reality, Robert N. Skier and Marty Eisenberg tried their hand at another VR episode. Much like in What is Reality, Batman would find himself trapped in a VR world, but with floating platforms, pterodactyls, and other such shenanigans. However, this time, instead of the Riddler, the perpetrator would be a 10-year-old kid. Well, he was originally planned to be 10, but Marty Pasco told them to age him up a little bit since BSNP wouldn't allow a villain that young. Not that it ended up mattering anyway, as the show was never produced. According to Wizard Magazine issue number 12, there seemed to be plans at one point to bring in the Calendar Man and the Gentleman Ghost, though we weren't able to track down any more info on either of those premises. And now we come to the final Lost episode from season 1, The Count and the Countess. Initially planned to be the 15th episode of the series, Bruce Timm sent the script to Japan, hoping that farming out the production process completely to the overseas studio would free up the in-house staff's time to work on better shows. Ultimately, the episode was canned as the studio took months to produce even character designs and a partial storyboard, which were all drawn in a style too off-model to be usable. As a result, the production number was ultimately reassigned to the episode See No Evil, which was actually the 57th or 58th show produced. This led to See No Evil later finding its way onto the series Volume 1 DVD, despite having been created much later. But what was the episode about? Well, there doesn't seem to be much info out there. While a posting on TV Trope suggests the episode was written by Marty Pasco and was mentioned in episode roundup blurbs featured in the tie-in issues of Batman Adventures, I actually pulled out my box of back issues and saw no indication of those blurbs even existing. Perhaps the info they were recalling was in a magazine article somewhere, but... I digress. Series writer Dan Reba shared a small amount of info on the premise during an appearance on Batman the Animated Podcast, stating it was like a spoiled heiress that's, you know, whatever. But he didn't go any further into the details. Over the years, some have theorized that perhaps this is the fabled episode in which Bruce Wayne would have been turned into a vampire. But in fact, that didn't happen until much later on in the series. But for more info on that, you're gonna have to stick around for part two. So go ahead and hit that subscribe button Button and hit the bell to turn on notifications because you're not gonna want to miss it. We've dug up tons of fascinating stuff and I can't wait to share it with you. But hey, if you're already subscribed, maybe check out our Patreon. We offer a ton of cool stuff over there, such as discounts on merch, monthly hangouts with other patrons and ourselves, custom artwork, and even more. So if that's something you'd be interested in, go to patreon.com slash DCAU Watchtower and check out what we've got going on over there. Um, I didn't write an actual end. I added the Patreon thing, but I guess I didn't really end it. So now I'm having a crisis because I've sat here for about 30 minutes recording this and I don't have an... Uh, a, a, a. So do the things that you normally do for YouTubers that you like. Like the video, comment, hit the subscribe, go to Patreon. Hey, we've even got merch and coffee and there's an audible link somewhere. Just love us, please. Stick around for part two.